Good evening. Am I on? Soon? Hello? There we are. It's good to have you tonight. Glad that so many of you were able to come back and hopefully some are still on the way. Got a great treat tonight if you weren't here this morning just talking about everyday moments in life that we can really be aware of and make the most of. Super encouraging, super motivational. And um, at the end of the service, we're going to invite you to uh, do another offering. We're not passing plates. We don't do that, but there's a black box by the door. It's locked. There's a slot on the top, 
and um, we don't normally do Sunday evening services, and we're not asking for an extra offering for the church, but all of the money that is given tonight will go to the Montague family. So if you want to bless Ryan and Deborah and their family above and beyond what the church was able to afford through their budget, it's a great way for you to do that, as well as get one of the books because it makes great small group study or just personal devotion. So remember that as you leave, you can just write it to CBC, put in the, in the memo, Montague family, and uh, all of that money will get to them. So let me open us in prayer. Lord God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for today. Thank you for this amazing opportunity to learn all that you're doing. So many things that we're not really aware of from time to time, God, but just to, to have that awareness heightened as we're trying to live in a place that uh, you can use us in great ways. And so thank you for this reminder. Thank you for these challenges and all the inspirational stories and scriptures. And we just give you tonight and ask that you would move in each of our hearts uh, in a big way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're just going to start with a little bit of worship this morning. So will you, for this evening, it's the like fifth time I've said this morning, will you stand with us this evening as we prepare our hearts in worship? Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Shame's unknown and stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way when there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Broken dreams and wasted years Tell it all to disappear Let me tell you about my Jesus All the wrong turns that you would Go and undo if you could Who could work it all for your good Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is and the good news is I know that he could do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
my soul come away to hunger to see to thirst awaken first love come away and do as you did at first from my sleep, blow through the caverns of my soul, pour in me to overflow, to overflow, awaken my soul. Come away to worship with all your strength. Spirit of the living God, come flow for us on me. Come awake me from my sleep. Flow through the caverns of my soul. Pour in me to overflow. Come and fill this place. our prayer tonight. Spirit of the living God, come flow for us on me. Come awake me from my sleep. Flow through the caverns of my soul. Pour in me to God, that's our prayer tonight, Lord. We want to be woken up, Lord. We want to see your world all around us, God. So would you come, wake us up, God. Give us the eyes to see what only we could see through you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God. We praise you. Your Holy Spirit lives in us. That you found us worthy to live in us, to die for us, so that we could become a new creation in Christ with a renewing of our mind. Lord, that we would understand tonight that we're a house fit for a king, that our bodies are the temple of the living God.
Lord, that you would give us a tender heart, wisdom, love, grace, mercy, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control that we can represent you to a world that's hurting and doubting and questioning and seeking that there are millions of people that are desperate to hear a word from God, that are desperate to to receive a touch from God, that they're just waiting on somebody and someone a man or a woman of God that has the ability to slow down and to have eyes to see beyond themselves, Lord, that we would just be able to move beyond ourselves. That we could think of others more than we think of ourselves. Lord, that we would just be open and willing, that we would be able to slow the pace of life down and look for moments to move and breathe and be united with you in spirit, mind, body, and soul. And that we could actually touch the lives around us. That we could actually be the the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That we could be the vessels to whom you want to work through to touch the world around us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That while we're here on earth, we have an opportunity to bring heaven down and allow heaven to come through us. Lord, that you would just take us to new heights, to new levels, to new depths of understanding your great and glorious love for us. Even the Apostle Paul writes in several occasions that he just hopes and prays that people would be able to understand the love of Christ for them. That they would be able to just understand who they are as a son or as a daughter of a living king. Lord, that you would just transform our identities. Transform our hearts, transform our minds, God. And just move us. Move us into new spaces. New levels of love. New levels of compassion. New levels of grace and mercy. For love takes no account of wrongs. That we would make allowance for each other's faults. That we might actually be able to live in a small portion of unity that is called for us as believers that this house can be free of gossip, free of complaints, be free of offense. Lord, that you would actually transform our minds and our spirits, that we could actually be free of offense, that we would be unoffendable. No matter what people say or do, we would be unoffended because we know that they're deceived and they're acting out, that hurt people hurt people. The people aren't giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. That we would be able to be so confident and assured in our faith and who we are as sons and daughters that any attack would just be water off our backs. That it would just glance right past us. We would be free of offense and we would be able to turn and act in kind and in love. That we would repay no evil for evil, but evil with good. That we would actually take this word seriously to transform our lives, our communication, our relationships. To be able to live with a level of righteousness and purity that sets us out and sets us apart from the crowd. That we would be that light, the salt of the earth. Distinguishable from all others and that your light would just radiate through us Lord we thank you we praise you and it's Jesus mighty name we pray and everybody said amen, amen.
Amen. All right, wow. Uh, so it's so awesome to, to be back here uh, again tonight with you all. Uh, and this morning was, was amazing to be able to really dive into this idea of, of divine opportunities and divine appointments and, and opportunities for us to just step out in faith and be able to, to, to move. And again, to give people an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. That it's not uh, anything to do with, with, you know, again, having, having pride or, you know, a tally marks or building a resume. But it would actually just have to do with, with having compassion, being moved by compassion and love for people. And wanting them to have a taste of what we have inside of us and what we're living for. And actually be able to live in such a way that reflects the word of God. That if we really believe what this thing says that it says in, in terms of, that there's an actual heaven and hell. And that that's a hard reality, like wrap your mind around. And that there's hurting people that are separated because of sin, that have never repented of their sin or confessed and asked for, get, for forgiveness. And so naturally they're living in psychological torment and, and discomfort. And there's people that just need somebody with the boldness to come along to introduce them with that. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is, is both that, but also moving in spiritual intelligence and emotional intelligence. And the emotional intelligent piece is, is huge. To be able to actually move and flow in a way that, is, that creates open doors and open opportunities for people. That invites them in. And so that's what I'm excited to kind of get into and, and share here. And for starters, did anybody out there from this morning pray for a waiter or waitress at lunch? Any takers? Not a great start, people. <laughs> we got Jeff, because Jeff was with me. And I th threw him under the bus and made him step up his game. All right, well, this is your goal for the week. So, Pastor, yo, you got one? declined okay so one but would they just say like no no thank you yeah so yeah that's like wor that's the worst like the, they're not gonna that's the worst you, you get really usually is like is like no no I'm good okay there you go all right so this is so pastor Bob check with him next Sunday <laughs> and make him feel awkward if need be <laughs> And because this is part of it. I mean, there's, there's um, you know, the scripture that says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. And I feel like in our culture and in our times, uh, we've really ratcheted up our hearing. Is that, and that's why sometimes, you know, even when I sell the books, and, and the Untapped Potential book came out uh, a little over a year ago, and I, I barely, I think I made one social media post about that book. And it was really because God convicted me of, we spend so, many, so much time either just hearing and, and picking up another book. And that's why sometimes, I mean, if you bought the book, like, I mean, quite honestly, I tell people, like, if, if you are going to have to replace your Bible time in order to read my book, you're going to have to not be able to read your Bible for the day, then just don't read my book and just read the Bible. And, and, and I think that goes for a lot of these other books. The not, very few books out there preach as hard as the Bible does. And, and so it just cuts straight to the heart of the matters. We've got to be engaged in the Word, but not just hearers, but actually be doers. Because we just hear, and we hear some more, and we hear some more podcasts, and we hear another podcast, and we hear another audio book, and we hear another video, and another video sermon, and you're not just listening to Pastor Bob, you're listening to a couple other pastors online, and we just consume, 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 but we never actually stop and just do. Like, you all, you know, if you, you wouldn't be here if you, you know, weren't taking this thing seriously, and I'm sure many of you have been walking for decades with the Lord, so at a certain point, we just have to decide, like, I'm just going to walk this thing out, and that's honestly, that's what I had to do, was just like, you know, I was reading all these books, which can be totally helpful, and a lot of books have framed my, you know, understanding, and given me a, a better mindset for going and approaching things, but it, there's, at a certain point, you just have to be, I'm going for it, uh, I'm doing it, and, and it has to, and, and for me personally, I hit a place of just kind of like desperation where I was hearing all these amazing, incredible stories from all these other people and starting with my father-in-law, but then all these others of just sharing these crazy testimonies of divine appointments and miracles and healings and all this stuff. And I just got to the point where I was like, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, 
Like, I want that. I want to be a part of that. I want to experience that. I don't just want to hear other people's testimonies. I want to have my own testimonies. And that's what's so powerful about Jesus' story of, of the woman at the well. And, and one of the lines that stands out to me from that is that when Jesus approaches this woman at the well and, you know, he calls her out for having five, five husbands and not living with the man that, uh, or not being married to the man she's currently living with, and then she goes running back uh, to, tell the, to tell the Samaritan village. And she says, he told me everything I ever did. This is the Messiah. You got to come and see. And so all the Samaritans come out to see Jesus and they, they beg him to stay for two extra days. And... And then they stop at the end of it, and they, they look at the woman, and they said, at first we believed because of your testimony, because of what you said, but now we, we've seen him and heard him for ourselves, and now we know indeed that he is the savior of the world. They went from a second-hand experience to a first-hand experience because they were willing to step out and experience Jesus. And there's far too many people living off of the second-hand experiences and stories of other people. And this is the idea that, you know, you've heard the, the old adage of, uh, you know, you give somebody a fish, you feed them for a day. But you teach somebody to fish, and you feed them for a lifetime. Well, I think it's the same way with these divine appointment stories, is that you share a divine appointment story with somebody, and you can feed them spiritually for the day. But if you teach people to go out and experience these divine appointments for themselves, you feed them spiritually for a lifetime. And so that's this switch that we have to, to make from here to doer. And it's just picking out some, some small things and some places to start where we can actually begin to do that. And quite honestly, you just you know, writing the thing on the, on the, uh, and on the, the receipt, like that's a place to start. And then you grow more comfortable of getting a little bit out and a little bit out and a little bit out. And... I'm going to be a little bit kind of all over today, but this kind of leads into what I was going to read to you from 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, verse 32. And this is uh, the story of David as he's about to go fight Goliath. And so in uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 through 37, again, David has uh, the Goliath has been, you know, taunting the Jews. Nobody will go out and fight him. Everybody's kind of, you know, walking away and, and kind of being sheepish about the whole thing. And, and, and then David shows up on the scene. And David says this, Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. And this is where it comes into play here for us. He says this, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to, to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defiled the armies of a living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of a lion and a bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul sees the, and hears the conviction in his voice and says, Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. And he said, and may the Lord be with you. And the reason I read that to you is that David didn't just rush out and, and fight Goliath and take on this, this massive warrior is that he says first he was able to take on both lions and bears. And so it's this idea here that the confident expectation of a big win with the Lord comes from a track record of smaller wins with the Lord. So it's, and that's why I try to be careful with some of the stories that I share, not to, because I've got other amazing, really incredible, you know, prophetic word stories, words of knowledge stories, and things like that that I often don't even share, because I don't want it to feel like it's too big and too, too far out of reach for people. I want it to feel like it's within arm's reach. And that'll be some of the stories that I'll share today because it's, it's about creating, building small wins and stepping out. And that's, that's the process that I went through, was just stepping out, small wins, and looking for, because really, we don't hear it in Scripture, but David probably also didn't just necessarily start with lions and bears. You know, he was probably practicing, you know, with, with raccoons, with, you know, maybe an obnoxious goat. 
And he's just like, and just like picking off things. And he's working his way up. So maybe you need to find a raccoon equivalent of a divine opportunity, an obnoxious goat equivalent of a divine opportunity before you work your way up to to the to the lion or to the bear and then to Goliath. But the idea is like once you just start inching your way out, then you realize like wow, that was actually a lot easier. Like wow, even then even though they said no thank you, like you probably just felt good that you were obedient and you actually said it to begin with. I mean, did that feel a little bit like hey, at least we said it? Yeah, I mean, there's, so that's like part of it is even when I step out and share <clears throat> and ask somebody like that and they say, no, thank you, quite honestly, I'm just like, hey, I was obedient. Like, that's good enough for me. And so that's a big, big part of it. And you just, you, there's such a bigger story going on in people's lives that you just have no idea about. Because what if this same waiter or waitress had a couple there for, for breakfast and that, bre- and that that breakfast, that couple said, hey, you know what? We were just about to pray for our meal. Is there anything we can pray for you about? No, I'm good. And then they come in for lunch. Hey, we were just about to pray for our meal. Is there anything we can pray for you about? No, nah, I'm good. And then somebody else comes in for dinner. And then he's like, what the heck is going on with these people? <laughs> all right, finally, I give up. Yeah, like I got all this stuff going on. <laughs> and because that's, that's oftentimes what happens. Even there's a, a woman at Starbucks and she was uh, sitting there on like a Kindle e-reader and I was kind of working and just kind of saw her just reading her little thing there. And I just felt like God wanted me to kind of go over and, and see if I could pray for her. And so I think I actually had an extra book on me. So I took a book and was just like, hey, you know, I just noticed you over here reading and, and I kind of introduced myself. My name is Ryan. And I just kind of felt like, like God maybe wanted me to come over here and, and pray for you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And she's like, no, no, not really. Like, I'm I'm good. Or she said, you know, no, there's not, there's not really anything. And I was just like, oh, hey, wow, then life, life is, must be awesome. And I wasn't trying to be, like, snarky or rude. I was just, like, genuinely, like, shoot, if you don't have nothing to pray for, like, life is great. And, and she was like, wow, I mean, you know. And <laughs> so then you kind of, like, now they're kind of, those people are trapped because everybody knows, <laughs> like, there's always something or someone uh, to be able to pray for. And she said, you know, well, actually, you know, my, my sister-in-law just got out of uh, cancer surgery. And, and I guess you can, you can pray for her. And so I kind of got her name and, and was like, hey, you know, can I sit down real quick and, and just kind of pray for you now? And she's like, that's fine. So I sat down and kind of prayed for, prayed for her sister and, and the whole thing. And as soon as I said amen and finished praying, she goes, wow, like that's so crazy. Like, you know what, as you were praying, I actually went through a similar cancer surgery just like she did several years back. And when I finished and got done with my surgery and headed back out, there was a guy that stopped and prayed for me, and he prayed for me exactly the same way that you just prayed for her. She's like, wow, that's so crazy. So here again was a moment where it was initial no, and I don't always do that. Sometimes if it's, I mean, you could tell kind of the difference between like a hard no. (laughs) And I got one of those like uh, like a week and a half ago. Somebody gave me like a hard no. And I was like, no, that's like a firm no. I'm just going to let that thing ride out. Um. So it's trying to pick up on some of the emotional undertones of things, too, between a no that's like, I'm kind of testing you to see if you're really serious or not, or if you're actually patient enough to get around to hearing what I might need to share, versus like uh, a hard no. But all of these little moments, imagine, it, I mean, think about how many millions of, of Christians are just in, in L.A. County and, and kind of Southern California. Imagine if we were all doing this. We were all stepping out every day. And just like, even for those people that are hard no, the Holy Spirit's just like, poof, 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 like just kept plowing away each day because there's another believer coming along. And then we wouldn't have to just sit around and have, have prayer meetings for revival. We would be revival. If that were to actually take place and we were all actually able to walk this stuff out, even in just small little ways of being faithful, and hey, felt like God put you on my, put you on my heart today. Like, how can I pray for you? And being able to do that and taking on the small wins just like David did before you get to the Goliath. Because then what, what's happening is that we live in a culture and a time where our technology addictions are out of control. We're so consumed by our phones as our primary means of, of communication. And everything that we do is through text and, and so many of the messages. And this is why we've kind of lost the ability to have some of these face-to-face conversations and be able to even raise some of these basic things in conversation because our, our social comfort zone has shrunken, 
you know, to the size of, of, of an orange. And we have such a hard time anything beyond that. And that's, the, that's spiritual warfare. Is that he wants our comfort, our social comfort zone, as small and as restricted as humanly possible. Because then we don't even feel comfortable even just asking, hey, we're just about to eat for lunch. Is there anything we can pray for you about? Because we fear uh, a no or maybe like some side eyes. Like, like worst case scenario, you're probably going to get is like an eye roll. Like, oh my gosh, how did I, I go tell somebody in the underground church in China how bad that eye roll hurt your feelings <laughs> when that person said no, you couldn't pray for them. Because they'd be like, what, you even get to ask people that you can pray for them? Like, you have the freedom to just go into a grocery store and ask somebody if you can pray for them and admit and tell people you're a Christian? Like, we, we can't admit or tell anybody that we're Christians. Like, we're so locked up and have to keep this concealed because of fear of imprisonment or being literally turned against families. One of the best things I've done is I, I went to, the, I signed up for the magazine, The Voice of Martyrs. And if you just go to persecution.com, and, and you can sign up to receive their monthly newsletter, and it's about persecuted Christians around the world. And the stories you hear are nuts. The last one was just a lady in, I think it was Iran, who her whole family were extreme Muslim. She, I think, encountered Christ through a dream or something, became a Christian, and her family locked her in a room for three years and just tortured her. And she had to get a cross. Well, in order to get into a Christian church there, you have to get a cross so that they know you're legit because they're worried about just people coming in and, you know, lighting the church on fire or shooting the pastor and things like that. And so she had to get a cross uh, tattooed on her arm, and so they poured acid on it trying to get the, the tattoo off of her arm. And so, I mean, this is like what people are experiencing in other parts of the world, and yet the enemy has us so confused and so restricted with our social comfort zone that we don't even feel comfortable just asking people if we can pray for them. And again, I'm, play, I'm coming from a place where, like, I've been there. Like, I'm still, there's still parts of me that has to overcome this stuff. So it's not a place of, like, judgment of people that don't. Like, I've been there. Like, this has been a process and a journey of trying to stretch the comfort zone back out. And that's, that's what it takes, is to, every day, just those little ways, those little moments, inch by inch, we push that social comfort zone back out an inch at a time with all those small little wins of asking somebody that you can pray for them or sharing a word of encouragement and just saying, hey, you know what? Like, you know, I just felt like the, like the Lord put, put you on my heart and, and I wanted to encourage you. Like there's a woman at, at Star, I'm gonna share all my Starbucks stories today. Um, another woman at Starbucks, I was sitting there kind of working and uh, saw her come in in a wheelchair and she was being pushed uh, in the wheelchair by she had two boys. The oldest was maybe like 11, uh, and then the other was maybe nine, uh, pushing her in, and, and, you know, they got their drinks, and then I was kind of waiting to see if they were going to set up in there, and sure enough, they were kind of leaving, and so while I saw them, and again, this is a question to ask. If you just notice somebody, just ask God, why am I noticing them? And then just the thought came to me of like, wow, like the character that's being shaped in these boys is next level, the integrity that God's developing in these two boys is, is going to be done in such a way it probably couldn't have been done in any other way. And so I, I went out, and uh, they were leaving, so actually I kind of helped, helped hold the door open for them as they were leaving out, and I just said, hey, you know, uh, hi, my name's Ryan, kind of introduced myself, and I was just like, hey, you know, I'd, I saw you in there earlier, and I felt like God just wanted me to kind of encourage you and, and to share this with you. But, uh, and I think first I kind of asked her what was going on, and she had been in, like, uh, bed rest for, like, six weeks. Uh, she was living with her parents because the dad's not in the picture. And uh, so she was really feeling down because not only was she dealing with all this body stuff and, and illness, but also she just felt like, you know, my boys are having to push me around. My parents are still having to take care of me, and, and I just want to be able to give and, and do. And, and so she shared that, and I said, well, I just felt like God wanted me to encourage you and just say, like, the work of integrity and character that God's doing in these two boys is, is going to be life-changing and that God's going to use them to be leaders to their peers at such a young age because of the character and integrity that's being developed and molded in them right now. That God is refining them in such a powerful way that 
possibly couldn't have happened in any other way. So I just wanted to encourage you. I know this is hard, what you're going through, but there's a greater work, and there's a greater story being told in all this. And so I just said, you know, can I pray for you? So she kind of told me what was going on. I prayed for her, and then just kind of blessed them, and, and, and she took off. So all of these little moments, again, are small wins where you're inching back out that, that degree of, of social comfort. It's all the 20 seconds of courage that it takes. And the reason I focus on the 20 seconds of courage uh, is because a lot of that is, is psychological too. Is that there was a study that was done about trying to get people to exercise and work out. And they called it the one song workout where they took two different groups of people and they had one group of people that they told them that they, their goal for, the, we, for you know, the next several weeks was to go to the gym and work out uh, for like four days a week for like an hour, hour and a half sessions at the gym. The other group, they told them their goal was to work out four times a week for the length of one song. That's like what, like three and a half minutes? Uh, unless you're listening to this, yeah, Hill song, and then it's like, <laughs> and then it's like 15. Uh, but if you listen to like, the, if you work out for the length of one song, like three and a half, like you're not going to be a triathlete <laughs> like anytime soon. But what they found at the end of the study was that the group that received the instruction of linking out, working out for the length of one song actually worked out more often and for longer durations than the group that had the, the goal of four times to the gym for an hour and a half or for an hour. And, and they, what they found out was that the hardest part about working out is starting to work out. How many people can attest to that? That, that Yeah. So we, we've been, so the hardest thing about s- divine opportunities is starting one. Once you start, that's the hardest part, is just starting the conversation. It's just getting up and walking across the room. It's just saying, hi, you know, I just, you know, my name is, and getting into it. It's extending just the, hey, can I, can I pray for you? It's that 20 seconds of courage. The hardest part of a divine opportunity is just starting it. And then just being open to where God takes it. And sometimes it goes nowhere. Sometimes it goes somewhere. Sometimes I meet really weird, odd people. And, and, and that's the, the, the only time I ever see them. And it's like, well, it's kind of weird or awkward or whatever. And, and you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes late coming home, but my wife knows why. And, and then sometimes, like, I met a weird guy at McDonald's in, like, four years ago. And honestly, I probably talked to him more than anybody else uh, outside my family. And it's been a total divine appointment. He started, uh, he actually accepted Christ a year after I met him in McDonald's. And, and it's been a, just a, such a mutually encouraging relationship of, of just some random, and he, I mean, he, he was awkward. He's still kind of awkward. And even if he hears this, he knows. And uh, he might say that I'm awkward. But it was, again, you just, you just never know who God's putting in your path and who needs, who needs a friend, who needs to hear from somebody that actually has a heart for Christ and has some steadfast faith in them. So this is the, this big part of being able to push and stretch the comfort zone back out. And we stretch our comfort zone back out by and for the glory of God. And so this is such a, a big piece to this whole process. So I'm going to read some scriptures here too. And this idea that you're a living letter for Christ. And so 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says, We plead with you, encourage you, we encourage you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy, for he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. We urge you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. So even as we look at our lives, is it reflective of the price that that Christ paid for us on the cross? Are we willing to actually step out and live a life that's worthy of the calling? Ephesians 4.1, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Colossians 4.5-6, Live wisely among those who are not believers, and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive, so that you will have the right response for everyone. 2 Corinthians 2.14-16, But thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. So again, catch that. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. 
But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 says, Clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written, this, is, this letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of a living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. It's this idea that our lives are meant to be a testimony. Just like those letters that Paul wrote are a testimony of God's activity in people's lives and the goodness of God and the glory of God, that's what our lives are meant to be, a living epistle, a living letter of God's goodness and God's glory and God's work in us and through us and for others. And so this is that part that I know many of you feel like I did, where you're tired of partial faith. You're tired of shy, weak, timid faith. And that you're ready for boldness and power in the name of Jesus. And that you're ready to go to those next steps. And and you're ready for a confident, captivating, and transformative faith. The kind of faith that occurs when you step out into the unknown and experience God's provision. That a friend once said that the, the, the devil's actually okay with you having partial faith. Because partial faith doesn't transform hearts and it doesn't change the world. So he's okay with people coming to church on Sunday, just like it, scripture says, like looking in the mirror and seeing your face and then walking away and forgetting who you are. So the, the enemy's okay with people coming to church as long as they forget who they are by lunch or as long as they forget who they are by the start of work on Monday. And it's why when people wake up and they read devotionals and they engage in the word, but then they go right back into their busy schedules. And there was a study called the Good Samaritan Study uh, where they actually, again, kind of set up this experiment. We know the, the Good Samaritan story where the guy's beaten and bloodied on the side of the road and kind of the priest goes by, the Pharisee goes by, neither help. And then the, the Samaritan, his kind of enemy, actually sees him and treats him and, and takes care of him. And so they assigned, again, two different kind of groups of seminary students to uh, prepare a little sermonette. And so they gave them about 20 minutes. One group got kind of like random biblical topics to prepare a little sermonette for. And then the other group all got the Good Samaritan study, or, or story, to prepare a sermonette on the Good Samaritan. Then they were sending them from building A to building B. And on the way, they had an actor that was sitting out lying and moaning in obvious pain. So they're setting these people up to see will, who will be more likely to respond, those with random topics or those with the Good Samaritan. And, and what they found was, unfortunately, those with the Good Samaritan topic for their sermonette were no more likely to stop and help than the others were. Even though they had literally just read it, prepared for it, and were ready to speak on it, what they found was the only difference between people stopping and not stopping was that those that felt like they had plenty of time to get to building A were likely to stop. Those that felt like they were rushed or behind or going to be late did not stop, or few stopped. And so the difference wasn't being primed with the right devotional, it was being primed with the right pace of life. And so you can read those devotionals every Sunday morning, but then you go out into the rushed pace of life, and then you, you forget who you are, and you forget why you're there, and we walk right past hurting people every single day. And when we're busy, we begin to see people as obstacles rather than as opportunities. And I know that speaks to some people in here, that when you're busy and you're rushed and you're feeling behind, you see people as an obstacle. And you see all these things as like, why would I get the red light? Well, probably because somebody has to. Like, why would this road have this many stop signs? This is from the pit of hell. Like, who put all these here? It's just like, it's just, so we get all these things when we're rushed and we're feeling behind and, and struggling. Then all these people become obstacles rather than opportunities. And I'm just trying to get by them rather than to actually engage anyone or be open to the idea of, of anyone. So this is why we've got to radically change our pace of life and be willing to actually do And this is crazy, crazy hard. And this is why so few people do it is because it really requires living a radical life that's actually reflective of the word of God and not the patterns of this world. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but allow for a renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to discern God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. But what most people do, they never get out of the patterns of the world. 
They never fully allow for a complete renewing of their mind. And so whenever they're trying to discern God's will, they're trying to discern God's will through the lens of the patterns of the world, which is why everybody wants to know, what does God want me to do for work? What does God want me to do for school? What's God want me to, who does he want me to marry? Where does he want me to live? What kind of car does he want me to buy? All these kinds of things, it's all about my kingdom and my will rather than God's kingdom and God's will. And so we've got to be able to break free from the patterns of this world, but they are a deadly trap, and they are some severe bondage for so many people that, honestly, a lot of people aren't living bad lives, and that's that line of, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. This is the mentality, is that you don't even have to be bad. As long as you're busy, and as long as you're too concerned about stepping on people's toes, then you're going to be too cautious to even be effective for the kingdom of God. And people are always so worried about stepping on people's toes or offending people that they never reach out and that they've just become completely ineffective. So even if you can just live a good life and have the comforts of this world, then that becomes our, our goals. And then we put these pressures on one another as Christians, which is why every high school senior gets asked, what do you, where, are you, where are you going to college? What's going on next? What are you doing? And then you graduate college. What do you, what, where you got internships? Where are you going to work after this? And then they get a job. When are you getting married? Are you getting married? When are you going to have kids? When are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? It's just all this winning, winning, winning. And all those things are is just patterns of the world. We just heap on the patterns of the world on one another. We keep each other busy. We, keep, we dangle the carrot. So when you do graduate high school, we just move the carrot to college. When you graduate with the bachelor's, we move the carrot to a master's. When you get the master's, we move the carrot to the, your first job. When you get the first job, we move the carrot to the promotion. We move the you know, promotion to becoming the boss man or boss woman. And then we move that to then finally getting, you know, whatever it is. But the, the carrot always, always, always moves. You never get that. That's why everybody's got anxiety. Everybody's, uh, you know, tormented by all the patterns of the world and all the pressures and all the expectations because now we live with social media where you're seeing everybody's highlight reels and everybody else's life is doing this. And look at them. Oh, my gosh, look at me over here. And you don't know the crazy thoughts going on in their head. You don't know the crazy stressors going on in their life. You're just seeing one little quick snapshot and then judging by comparison. And it, comparison is the thief of joy. And so, again, there's just, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all this stuff that really keeps us from, from ever doing that and, and actually ever stepping out. And the first combination, I'll just kind of go through them quickly, but it's the spiral of silence and political correctness. Spiral of silence is a media theory that says that whoever thinks they're in the, my, the majority, their voice, they become more bold in speaking out. Whoever thinks they're a part of the minority begins to speak up less and less. And those minorities and majorities don't even have to be actual numbers of reality, just making you feel that way. So if the media makes you feel like you're part of the minority, then you're going to be less likely to speak up. If the, the media makes you feel like you're part of the majority, you're going to be more likely to speak up. Which again, they're not in the habit of you know, putting great things that Christians do out in the news. It's like there's plenty of great things Christians are doing you're never going to see in the news. It's like, what pastor like, had an affair and you know, dropped the ball and did all this and did crazy stuff? Let's throw that. So, and then political correctness, gone to extremes. And then you also kind of add on to that with uh, fear of social rejection, which is people's number one fear. And you add to that shame and disqualification. And so rather than uh, feeling qualified by Christ, we disqualify ourselves in the process. And I think so many times people feel like, oh, people are disqualifying me. Like, no, no, no. Like, you're the only one that can disqualify yourself. People can say what they want to say, but you're qualified in Christ. And then the other is busyness and technology. And which then we take the, the path of least resistance rather than the path of Christ-likeness. And then the other is, is moodiness and me time. Constantly people are just moody and irritable to their emotions and then they need more me time But their me time is just Netflix and chilling. It's just drinking. It's just smoking weed. It's just it's just numbing and times of, of of that which me time is fine Jesus had me time, but his me time was going away and praying to the father Jesus's me time was was slipping away from the crowds and actually then praying and and getting filled up, and getting instructions, and getting marching orders from, from the Father. 
So our me time has got to be going back to, the, to Christ, going back to the Father, being connected to the source of well that never runs dry. And so we can give and give and give, but we're filled and filled and filled. And when we need our breaks, we go back to the Father and we spend time in prayer. And then, rather than allowing our mood to determine our Christ-likeness, we allow our Christ-likeness to determine our mood. And what ends up, that's one of the hardest things to do and get a hold of is that we allow our mood to determine our Christ-likeness. So if I am well-slept, I am well-fed, and I got energy, then like oh, everybody's getting Jesus. <laughs> but if I'm tired and hangry, ain't nobody getting Jesus. You're just getting the flesh, like no spirit. So this is that process of, of getting out of the moodiness and, and, and all that irritability and allowing your Christ-likeness to determine your mood. And allowing those feelings to just pass. And, and kind of sit, observe them, maybe even think, where did these come from? Take it in, understand that that's spiritual warfare and what's going on there. Because even with the emotions that get in the way of so much of this stuff, is that uh, this guy Dan Moeller says, because a lot of times people are saying, like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, God gave me these emotions. And he's like, no, God did not give, don't blame those crazy emotions you grew up with on God. You didn't get those from God, you got those from Adam. And you can tell the difference between the emotions that you got from Adam and the emotions you got from God by the fruit that they bear. If they're bearing bitter fruit, then those are from Adam. If it's bearing good fruit, then those are from God. But we've got to get outside of ourselves in this process. And the only way to do this is through surrender. And so the ultimate is just sur officially surrendering our lives that I'm tired of caring about what all these other people think. I'm tired of caring about what this waiter or waitress is going to think. I'm tired of caring about what this neighbor is going to think. I'm tired about what these people on social media are going to think. And, and it's exhausting, is it not, on worrying about what all these other people are going to think and we never actually live for God? Because I guarantee you, when we die and the second we go, we get called up, the second we see God and Jesus in all of his glory— we're going to immediately know all the things that were possible back on earth. All the things we could have said, all the things that we could have done, all the things that could have been experienced in him and through him the second we see him in all his glory. There's just no way, other way to even think about it. Uh, it's not like you're going to go to heaven, ah, I mean, he's all right. <laughs> like his hair's a little longer than I thought it was going to be. It's just like, no, the glory and the light, the, it, it, he's pure light. It's just going to, be blinding, and you're going to immediately know and see the power, the glory, and be like, oh my gosh. Like, why did I waste my time on that? And people think, you know, that God's angry at all these, you know, we kind of like talk about like sin as like social, you know, we really talk about it like almost like a socially acceptable sin. And it's the same, I kind of liken it with like debt, is that I've got a PhD, and so, you know, if I, you know, had like if I had like $50,000 in, in student debt with a PhD, you'd be like, hey, that's a good investment. That was a good investment. That was a good investment. But if I was just like, I have $50,000 on a Discover credit card, you'd be like, you have a problem. <laughs> like, you need help? Do you have Celebrate Recovery at this church? We need to get this guy in there. Uh, but because we think of it as like socially acceptable debt, and we do the same thing with sin. But I guarantee you, I, I really believe that when like, we get to heaven, God's not going to bring up your worst sin that you think and have in the back of your mind, all he's got to do is just read off a few numbers. How many hours you spent on social media in your lifetime? How many hours you spent on YouTube in your lifetime? How many hours you spent on video games in your lifetime? How many hours you spent gossiping in your lifetime? And we're going to be so mortified just on those numbers alone, he doesn't even have to touch any of the other stuff. Because we know that we... we, we wasted our lives and we wasted opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to share his great name because we couldn't quite overcome the social awkwardness of it all so i just want to walk through uh, i'm going to try to keep uh, just a couple of things and then we're <clears throat> i'll give you some some more examples here and we'll if you have questions too i'm going to create a little bit of time and and obviously uh, i'm probably less concerned about time you are because I get one, one day with you all, a Saturday and, uh, or Sunday morning and Sunday night here, uh, but we'll, I won't go crazy uh, over the time. But I want to just, I just want to answer some questions and squash some lies and some myths and actually prepare you to, to get you out there. 
And one of the things you can do here as a church is that I wrote about this in the Divine Opportunity book, but my father-in-law introduced me to the idea of a mana jar. And uh, his, the mana jar comes from Exodus chapter 16, where it's the manna that, that God put uh, on the ground for the Jews to be able to eat each morning as they were wandering through the wilderness. And so at the end of that, uh, we get to the, to the inscription where Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. He said, take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. Save it for the next generation because they didn't get to see it or experience it and they're gonna wanna hear this testimony from you. And they're gonna, so save it as a, as a remembrance and as a symbol for them. And so the idea is that when you do have a divine appointment, is that you find something that kind of reminds you of the divine appointment. And this is like a little exercise ball where you roll it and you either get like push-ups or walking lunges and stuff. But it reminds me of Eric Jackson in Palm Springs who is a, uh, a personal trainer that I met in a movie theater for watching a movie and ended up having a powerful experience of a group of us praying over him in the lobby of a movie theater and he was brought to tears. And, and there's so much more to all these, but you just little put little things in. And then uh, my father, you know, have this out on, you should have one as a church, have a manager for the church, and, but also have one personally. So you can have it out on your kitchen table or when guests come over. And what's funny is that the, the word manna means what is it? So the translation of, of that is they were like, saw it and they're like, what is it? And, but it was manna is the translation. And so when people see this kind of thing, of course, you know, I don't keep it in my house because my kids think that these are all toys. Um, and, and then they're all gone by the end of the day. But if you have this out, like people at some point, if it's in, you know, on the kitchen table or whatever it is, somebody's going to look at it and be like, what is that? And you're like, exactly. <laughs> Manna, what is it? And they're actually, let me, you know, go ahead and pick one out. And then they pick one out. Let me tell you the story about that. And it becomes this source of encouragement. And so I'm going to give you two quick stories that also just give you some greater perspective. One was, uh, again, kind of praying for people's healing and, and things, is that I was at Chick-fil-A, and I saw this woman uh, eating with, with uh, her husband, but she just had these, these bumps, these like really significant bumps all over her body, all over her, her whole face, neck, arms, just everywhere, these, these big bumps. And I felt like God wanted me to, like I should pray for her. But I'm also, again, trying to apply some emotional intelligence of not just get, you know, crazy and just, you know, be offensive or whatever, like, hey, I saw those bumps from like a mile away, let me pray for those. It's, <laughs> it's trying to be like sensitive, but also like, man, how do I even, how do I even get into that? And so I just prayed like, God, like, show me, show me a way. If you want me to pray for her, then just create a way or give me, give me something to go off of. And so I didn't really come up with anything, just kind of sitting there. They finally, they finish, they, they get up, and they, they go to leave, uh, leave Chick-fil-A. And I look over, and she had left a sweater. I was like, boom, like, here we go. So I went over, I grabbed her sweater, and I followed them. And they had just gotten outside, so I, I got outside and I said, hey, you know, you, you left your sweater. And she goes, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And, and we just kind of started chatting and, uh, and talking, and I was like, you know what, I just... Also, I, I felt like, you know, God kind of used this sweater to, to bring me out here because I, I, I felt like I should pray for you all. And I said, you know, is there anything I can pray for you all about? And again, it's just kind of leaving it open and also putting it in other people's hands. And, she, and they said, well, actually, we actually have a daughter and she's got a stomach issues going on and you can pray for her. And she said, you know, with, with you know, this, what I got going on, it's just really itchy. If you could just pray for the itch to go away. I was like, you got it. So I just prayed for the, for the daughter, prayed for the itch to go away, and it was this really amazing moment where it could have been, could have just, you know, left it, not even bothered, could have just gone in with maybe pride and arrogance and made it super awkward for everybody, but it's just trying to see what, what God is up to. And then one, one last one is that I was at, uh, I was in my office on campus, and where my office is outside the window is where all the tours end as they're bringing families, parents and, and their, their high school seniors through on the tour, and it stops right there. And so out of my window was this guy, and he had uh, a dad who had one crutch, a knee issue, and he had an in-arm IV. And so I was like, man, should I pray for him? Should I not? And I'm like, obviously, he's probably a Christian, and I'm sure he's had tons of people pray for him already. Um, you know, what difference am I going to actually make in this? And I was like, I, just on the fence about it. And so 
they finally kind of walk off, and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go kind of check it out. So I go out of my office, and I kind of walk, and they're a little ways ahead of me, and I'm still super hesitant. So they were began to kind of walk up one path on one side of the building, and then there's a building here, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to walk up on this side of the building, and God, if you want me to pray for him, then our, our paths will, will cross again. So I walk up here, I look over, they made a hard left, now they're even farther away. And I'm like, okay, like good enough. So I went back to my office, and uh, I was meeting up with a buddy, and we were going to go grab some lunch. And so I meet up with him, I said, you know, do you want to go to Mexicali, which is a Mexican place on campus? Do you want to go to Chick-fil-A, or do you want to go to Dickie's Barbecue? And he was like, let's go, let's go check out Dickie's Barbecue. And I was like, okay. So we go over to Dickie's Barbecue. We go in, which is just a little walk across the street. We go in. I order my food, and I turn around to get us a table, and I turn around, and sure enough, here's the guy with the crutch. <laughs> and I'm like, no way. <laughs> so, because all these things, now he, we're both off campus. My friend picked a restaurant. All these things, just like, this is too crazy. So I went over, just kind of introduced myself. It's like, hey, I'm a professor on campus. I happen to see you. You know, I was tempted to pray for you, but then I just told God, like, hey, our, pra- our paths will cross if you want me to pray for him, and here you are. Like, would it be okay if I prayed for you? Uh, and he's like, sure. And I think he had had a mountain biking accident, and it wasn't healing. Pray- he should have been healed, but it wasn't, and he had all this stuff going on with his knee, so kind of prayed for him, and, and says, you know, test it out. So kind of test it out a little bit. No noticeable difference. Oh, like, man, that's crazy. All right, let me pray for it again. Pray for it again. All right, test it out. No noticeable difference. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, what are the odds all this stuff happens for like a non-healing? They're like, this is a lot of work, God. Uh, we could have gone to Chick-fil-A. Uh, and so I'm like, man. So then we just started talking. And then I hear this guy behind me. He goes, hey, man. And I turn around, and it's this dad uh, eating lunch with his son. And he goes, he goes, man, I just want to tell you, like, I've never seen a Christian, like, step out like that with that kind of boldness and that kind of faith. And I just wanted to tell you how encouraging that was, that I need to start stepping out and I need to be more courageous myself. And I was like, dang, like what if all, like all that was just for this guy? (laughs) And it's, so that, I just want to encourage you with that story because I've had that happen another time at In-N-Out where I prayed for uh, a Vietnam vet that had, you know, tons of trauma, led to a divorce because of it, some suicide attempts in the past. I'm praying for this guy, and I said, man, like, God bless, uh, and everything. And I get up to leave, and there's these, there's like a young mom, a little kid, and a young grandma, and their eyes just were filled with, with tears. And they said, we just wanted to say, like, that was amazing what you did. Like, we've never really seen anybody step out with that kind of boldness, and it really convicted us and challenged us that we need to start stepping out. So, so many of these divine appointments are just, they're not even what you think they're about. So even when you're like, man, what a, what a loss, what a bummer, it's like maybe somebody overheard them at the table next to them actually even offer that. Or there's something else going on you don't even know about. And so this is that encouragement that even in your failures, God's still doing something. Either in you or in them or in an onlooker or on listener. There's stuff that's going on we don't even know about. It's just in the spiritual realm that God's doing stuff and touching people, even when we think we're failing miserable and we're dropping the ball and, man, I blew it. I should have said this instead and should have done that. It's just like God's doing stuff, and you just have to trust the process. Trust the process. And that's this stepping out with, with boldness. And Reinhard Bonnke was an evangelist to, a German evangelist to Africa. He said, everywhere we go, we should leave behind a trail of blessing and deliverance. And it's just blessings of whether it's prayer, compassion, encouragement, deliverance, even if it's just from a bad mood. Is if you ever talk to somebody that just put you in a better mood, well, they delivered you from that bad mood. Even if it's just that, delivering people from bad moods, because we just have a smile on our face, we got the joy of the Lord in our heart, and we're just delivering people from bad moods. Like, what if we were known for that? Like, just delivering people from bad moods. Like, man, I love seeing this person come into this coffee shop because they put me in a better mood. I love seeing this person, you know, come to my auto body place because they put me in a better mood. What, and what if, what, like, what if we actually believed this thing and started living it out? And there's a, a quote that crushes me from this guy, Jordan Peterson, who's a psycho- Canadian psychologist, and he's kind of, you know, really renowned on, on YouTube, but he was asked, because he does a lot of stuff biblically, teaching on the Bible, all these different things, but he's not a Christian. Somebody asked him, like, why aren't you, like, what, like, why aren't you a Christian? And he said, well, there's a, there's a real stumbling block to being a Christian. And it's the fact that 
Christians aren't sufficiently transformed enough for me to believe that they even believe in God. The Christians aren't sufficiently transformed enough for me to even believe that they believe in God. So why are you asking me why I don't believe in Christ? And the reason he reserves that is because he knows. Like, if you say that Christ is, is Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, like, that's legit. <laughs> like, if you stop and think about what that means. And, and that's the, the weight of these people that have actually stopped and considered that versus what they've seen in other people's lives. And so... Uh, Is there actually anybody here with like pain in their in their body that has any pain? That's we got a couple. All right, what do you, what do you got? Would you might would you feel comfortable coming up? Would you so if you, if I prayed for you, would you know if something changed? Okay. So I Ryan Mark. Mark. Okay. So also in this is just to be able to show you all. That this can actually be, again, it, for me it was helpful just to see people do it and then have at least some sort of template or model to go off of. So again, we just met Mark. So Mark, man, tell me like what's, what's going on if you're comfortable yeah, doing my so. my back's been killing. Like, okay. Has, yeah, I, they did an x-ray and they said that might might have a um, stress fracture, but okay. I don't know what, okay. what it is. Or yeah. So where, where exactly at on the back? Right now it's like kind of like almost like my lower back. Okay. Like almost my butt. <laughs> in the middle or? It's kind of like where it fit. It, it hurts like right here. Yeah. Okay. Like and. Or whatever. Okay. So does it feel like a pinched nerve or something or? I guess. Is it just, okay. Yeah, I kind of feel like pain that goes down my legs a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what we're doing when we're doing that is we're, we're trying to figure out what, how the, our prayers can be more specific. Okay. So the more we kind of know, and again, we're not trying to like, you know, pry a bunch, but if people are willing to share, then you can just, your prayers can be more specific and you can be more intentional about it. Okay, so uh, how did it start? I don't know exactly. Like, I feel like a year ago, uh, it, like, my back was hurting and so I got a new mattress and that seemed to help. Okay. And then maybe like three months ago, uh, my wife and I went jet skiing and like I felt when I was pounding, like I felt it like okay. hurt, you know? Yeah. And so, but then it kind of like subsided and then we went camping and then it was just like really bad and it's just been bad. Okay. So that's when I went to the chiropractor to get it checked out. Okay. So on a scale of like one to ten with the pain, where where would you put it? It varies. It's probably like a seven. Right now? Yeah. I mean, right now it's probably like a five, but it depends on the, okay. the position that I'm in. Okay. So a five right now? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay if I pray for you? Yeah. Is it okay if I put my hand on your back? Yeah. Okay. So again, even to, especially with COVID and everything else, it's good to, to just ask questions. Is it okay if I pray for you? Is it okay? You know, if you can put a hand on it, you know, whatever, shoulder, knee, ankle. But it's always good to, like, ask people. And it's, I always do that, especially if, if it's a woman, you know, just being really kind of clarifying, or sometimes I just don't even, don't even, you know, go there at all. But it's always good to just be able to say that and put the ball in their court, and they can always say, no, you know, can you pray without that or whatever it is. And you can always say that too. You know, I can pray without putting my hand on it if that's, if that's more comfortable for you. So again, there's not like a, a secret recipe to exactly how this is going to happen. And obviously, um, you know, it's up to God anyway. So, all right. So Mark, right? All right. So right here. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God. We thank you for Mark. We thank you for bringing him to this church and being a part of this church community. We thank you for the love that you have in him. So Lord, we just pray right now that you just fill him with the Holy Spirit from the top of his head to the tip of his toes your Holy Spirit just comes upon him, that right now he just feels a peace, even as he breathes in right now, he just breathes in more and more of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the peace coming upon him right now. Back, we command you to be healed right now in Jesus' name. Pain, get out right now in Jesus' mighty name. Spine, be healed right now. Muscles, be loosened. Vertebrae, be loosened in the mighty name of Jesus. Nerves be loosened in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Pain, get out right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so maybe try, try something. You said it was a five. Maybe try something that would, not getting too crazy. Okay. All right, that's fine. Walk around a little bit more.
Okay, let's pray. Is it okay if I pray again? Yeah. All right. So again, this is, you know, part, part of it is that sometimes nothing, nothing happens. You know, first try, you pray a couple times. And this is also good because there was a blind man that Jesus had to pray for twice. So if Jesus had to pray for a blind man twice, then odds are we can give it a solid 12 shots. We won't do that, Mark. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll be here all night. I'm not taking no for an it. No, it's just. So, but, but I mean, that's, that's part of the realities. And, and so it's, it's easy, again, tempting to just want to pray and be like, hey, Mark, yeah, it was nice to meet you, man. Peace out. And then we don't even stick around to see if anything actually happened because we're fearful of what if nothing happens. And again, this is, it just is what I've been doing this just to also show you that, I mean, here I am in front of the church doing this rather than on the street where it's like, okay, nobody saw that. And we're, we're just out of here and rolling out. But it's just, it's part of also just showing the person love in the process of them being seen and, and felt. And I had a conversation with a lady the other, with a young girl the other day after she was working on this podcast video thing that I was doing an interview for. And she just said, wow, like, you know, I just really felt felt by you. And oftentimes that's enough for people because they haven't had that in forever. And it's just like giving a glass of water to somebody that hasn't had a glass of water in a week and how refreshing just a simple glass of water is for people. All right, Lord, we just praise you. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Back be healed right now, 100% in Jesus' name. Pain, get out right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Muscles be loosened in Jesus' name. Spine be loosened in the mighty name of Jesus. Go back to your original design in the mighty name of Jesus. Muscles be loosened, pain, get out right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Test it out a little bit. I feel like it's been thicker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Still a five? What, where's the spot at? Yeah. Okay. A little bit higher. All right, let me pray one more time. And then I'll pray for you again later on. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, for your glory and your mercy. So, Lord, we just praise you. We thank you. And we, we bring your spirit of healing upon him. Holy Spirit, move right now. Pain, get out of this back right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, you set him free from this pain. In Jesus' mighty name, pain, get out right now. Muscles be loosened, back be restored and strengthened in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Maybe one last try here. So it's okay. <coughs> like this is wor worst case scenario and it's just like, it's fine. It is what it is. But we're also showing Mark some, some love in the process. Yeah, totally. So, okay. <laughs> I'll pray for you again uh, before we leave. All right, All right thanks man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank all right, so part of this, too, is also just being re willing to, to realize, like, you know, probably, too, I would, I would just pray over Mark. Hey, Mark, let me just pray for you just in general. And so I just pray over Mark. So it's the, the age-old question of, like, well, what if you pray for somebody and, and nothing happens is the thing that keeps most people from ever praying for anybody. <clears throat> and so part of it is, like, so Mark, right now, so you didn't get healed, but are you in, are you in any worse shape? <clears throat> and do you felt... Like, like I at least saw you and prayed for you and was willing to give it a shot. Yeah. So even if n you pray for somebody and nothing happens, then, then that, that's it. Like, either way, either way, Mark was, I mean, if I didn't pray, he's going out here with a hurt back. If I do pray and give it a shot and doesn't, he's going home with a, with a slightly hurt back. So quick question. Yeah. And I have my own quick questions and I want you to do So you're praying for a non-Christian. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So, I mean, part of this is that, to me personally, one of the biggest mystery, this is like one of probably the biggest biblical mystery, I think, for me personally, is like why some get healed and why others don't. Is like that will be the age old mystery from, from now to, to when Jesus returns, is like why some get healed and some don't. And, and the reality is, is that, too, like if 100% of the people you prayed for were healed, it doesn't take faith. Too, you just like you wouldn't even have to think twice about it. It's just like anybody, like er, all everybody's getting healed. 
And so part of that is it requires faith. It requires humility, too. It's like that's also like humbling <laughs> in the process. So part of it is understanding that, this, hey, this is, this is a bigger mystery as to what's going on. So, you know, if somebody were to, to ask, and again, also one of the reasons people don't pray for healing is because people have been really weird and awkward about it, where it's like, you need to have more faith. And, you know, it's just weird stuff. I've heard weird stories about people, you know, making them step on their glasses so they'd pray for their healing, and then their eyes don't get healed and their glasses are broken. And it's like, you know, it's like, sheesh. Like, it's one thing to pray and for not, but then to do that. So it's also just, again, the emotional intelligence has to be brought into the process as well. So even the, the question, uh, so restate the question again. Well, I, I get it from our perspective. Yeah. Perspective yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you say to encourage them or to give them a perspective? Yeah. Not about you, but about them. Yeah. I'd probably, you know, use Paul, who prayed for the thorn in the flesh to be taken away three times, and God said, you know, my power is, it works best in weakness. And so I'm like the greatest evangelist of Christianity of all time, prayed for God to, to heal him and to take some sort of ailment or something away, and God didn't. And so it's not about deserving or earning healing. Just like the, our faith is not about deserving or, or earning, it's, it's just being, being open to that. And hey, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna continue to pray for you because I know how much this issue is affecting you and how much you want to be healed. So I'm gonna continue to pray for you and to continue to pray in faith for you and just know that I'm gonna be doing that. And I don't know, you know, I, can, I can't answer any questions in terms of, of why. Just know it's not about you. And that, that this happens to, to so many. It's not about deserving. It's not about earning. But there's, there's, unfortunately, a bigger world and a bigger experience going on. But just know that God loves you. He sees you. And, and I just want to encourage you in that. So that would probably be that response to something like that. Other questions? Do anybody have? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Because I don't believe that the Lord has to wait in the wilderness to do what I'm doing where only the Lord can help me because they're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's something, you know, yeah, and it's just being open to, and that's not the end of it, too. Also, it doesn't have to be the end of it, is that a lot of times, you know, I might be praying tomorrow morning and think of, you know, a word for, uh, a word for Mark and be able to then share that with, with Pastor to pass it along. So also the, these moments aren't just like a one-time snapshot. I mean, sometimes you won't ever see them again or have the opportunity to reconnect. But it is being open to, God, is there something else about this that you want to reveal to them in there and through this? And just being open. And, but a lot of the freedom to even be able to kind of sense that and step out is letting go of the fear, letting go of the social awkwardness. And that, again, comes through practice and, and putting yourself out there in that. But yeah, that's good. Yes, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, those are great moments of surrender, uh, of that's what it is, of like overcoming yourself to actually be humble, to, to go and to respond to those kinds of moments. And there's been other times, too, I kind of d- was demonstrating this sort of thing in, a, in, a, in my classroom, and a girl uh, came up. She had like pain in her ear because her uh, earring, like, hole had, had been infected. And so it was just kind of painful, and so I was just kind of like demonstrating. And so I prayed for it, and then, uh, you know, again, kind of like, kind of like with, with what happened with Mark, and then she just went and sat back down. And then like 15 minutes later, she raised her hand. She goes, oh, by the way, like the pain's gone <laughs> now. And so it's like also like sometimes people don't get here w- right in the moment, and sometimes it's later, the next day. Again, there's a whole mystery of it, and the mystery is what keeps us from actually stepping out and doing any of this because we're just fearful of the awkwardness and, and other things. So it's, it's actually having, two, I think everybody needs to develop a, th- a theology of healing. And for me, it, it comes, a lot of it comes back, what I just hang my hat on is, is Luke 9 and Luke 10, is that in Luke 9, Jesus brings the 12 disciples, and it says that he endues them with power and authority to go out and to heal the sick and to teach them about the kingdom of God. And then in Luke chapter 10, he has the 70 disciples and again endues them with power and authority and sends them out with the same instructions to heal sick and teach them about the kingdom of God. And it's that they, you're go, going out and give them an experience and give them an explanation. Give them an experience and, and, and uh, Reinhard Bonnke is kind of protege. Daniel Kalenda said, you know, when people receive the gospel, they should get an experience with God as well as an explanation with God. They shouldn't just get an explanation of God and leave them in need of an experience with God. And so there's part of that that, again, is, is also this great commission to go out. And so that's the one that I kind of go back to, which, you know, I've got other friends that use, like, by his stripes we are healed. But I think that's, to me personally, I think that's kind of taken out of context. And so it's, it's, it's kind of figuring out and wrestling with some of that. But if you never actually work through any of these issues in your mind and, and make up some resolve about what you believe about scriptures— about healing and things like that, then you're probably never going to really step out, and you're always going to be on the, on the outskirts looking in and hearing other people's testimonies and never having any of your own, and leaving people, you know, uh, going in pain and not, and not stepping out with compassion is a big, big part of that process. And again, even just loving on people. That's why if you go with compassion, people will feel the compassion, they'll feel the love, even if they don't get healed, and it is what it is, but you, you go from there, and you, you get right back up, and you, you go again for the, for the next one. So that's a part of, the, part of the process and part of the experience. Any final questions? You want to ask about any of the divine opportunity stuff or, or stepping out? Yeah. 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 Yeah, good. I mean, again, sometimes sometimes you don't and and but you learn from it. And I talk about it in terms of like reviewing the game film. So every day like I, I review the game film just like an athlete 
You know, a lot of the football teams just played Sunday. Like, they're, tomorrow they're going to wake up and they're, start, they're going to start reviewing the game film from the past game and the next team coming up. And so part of it is just reviewing the game film. Okay, what was going on in my mind at that time? What was I feeling when I, the last time when I, you know, felt prompted and I missed it and I blew it and I didn't step out? What was going on? What was I feeling? Uh, what, what were the thoughts running through my head? And then you also, you're working on becoming a lie detector. And so again, the more that we read scripture, the better we come at detecting the lies of the enemy. And the lies of the enemy are those, those little whispers saying, you can't do that. That's going to be too awkward. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? You know, if, that, if, if nothing happens, what's everybody going to think about, you know, this or that? Or, you know, what if they, you know, do this or turn on me or whatever it is? But we come up with all these things where it's, is that the voice of God or is that, you know, just the voice of fear? Or is that the enemy? So you're reviewing the game film of even the, the missed opportunities. Man, what was I feeling? What was I thinking? Okay, now I know that lie and I know it's going to come. And so when I feel that come the next time and I hear that lie again, then I've got my scripture and my truth that I'm going to walk in. And so the more we review the game film, those things that were like brick walls to us before become speed bumps. And so then we hear those lies and we hear those whispers. And we're like, okay, I see, I see, I see what you're doing there. And, and it's just being willing to acknowledge that you know, a lot of the, the fears and hesitancies that we have are also promptings that we're kind of on to something with potential. And so it's being willing to actually step out and do that, do those things. But it, it's reviewing, not getting caught up in shame and condemnation. And a lot of times I'll pray, God, give me another chance. Give me another opportunity with that person. If it's somebody like that, that I'll actually maybe see again. Like that guy, if you want me to put him in my path again. If I miss an opportunity, with somebody, give me another chance. And, and being willing to do that. But learn the lies, learn the whisperings and all those things going on in your head. And then you become more and more equipped and you become better at detecting the lies. And then also, you know, I've heard it. How many it is written statements do you have stored up in your heart? So when Jesus was out in the wilderness and Satan was tempting him for 40 days and for 40 nights, he was speaking all these half-truths, twisted truths and lies. But Jesus always responded with, it is written. The man doesn't live on bread alone, but, but by the very word of God. So how many it is written statements do you have stored up in your heart and in your mind? So when those lies come, no, it is written, boom. It is written, boom, it is written, boom. And so that's where we're becoming more reflective and open and just catching those lies as they come in and just let them pass and, and walk in truth. So rather than walking by feelings, we walk by faith. Rather than walking by feelings, we walk by truth. And, and again, it's a, it's a process. Uh, of doing that, and we're all going to fall short from time to time, for sure, but the idea is that you, may, you capitalize on more opportunities and you miss fewer. That's the direction we're headed in, is capitalize on more, miss fewer, and, and, and that's the, the process for me, at least. Yeah. The other ones? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's big because sometimes you do feel confident and you're like, I know this is what God's calling me to do, and you, you go for it. And other times you're like, I, I'm not totally sure what to do here, God. So if you if you want me to, then then do this, and then you just walk to that and you know leave it as it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a journey. That's why, you know, I wish <coughs> somebody could roll in for, for two sessions in one day, and, and Bob's got a new, new church full of, you know, people, <laughs> and this, he's got to do four services next Sunday uh, because everybody's just going out like crazy. But it, it is a process. And, and also, everybody's at different points in their walk. So all of you are at different, different points. Some of you are ready to go, and this is what you needed, and you're going to start this week. And then others still have to kind of warm up to the idea where you have, you know, all these, these lies uh, that were spoken into your life that you got to let go and, and you got to break free from. And the lies are saying, you know, you're, you're too shy or you're not good enough communicator or you stumble over your words or you can't get, you know, you can't do this, can't do that. And we've got all these lies that we've allowed to, to seep in to our identity rather than being fully in the identity of Christ. And so it's, it is, for me, so much is trying to get outside of the feelings and, and walk by faith. And it's been, one, I just developed a hunger for it and a desire for it. And because I just didn't want to miss out. Quite honestly, where this came from, too, is that, uh, you know, we started, we started helping with a church plan about six years ago that has a big recovery background. And so there's a lot of people from recovery backgrounds and, and I would see these people that had these crazy backgrounds of just cr crazy drug addictions, sex addictions, you know, been in and out of jail and all this kind of stuff. And, and they got radically saved. And, they, and I'm like, and they're just crazy over the top with their faith and seeing all, God do all these awesome stuff. And, and I'm like, man, like I want that level of faith. And so one of the, the books that I'm slowly working on and, and the question that I'm really pursuing in life is well the post title is how to develop a passionate relationship with God without getting hooked on heroin <laughs> so again I understand we all fall short of the glory of God I'm not saying that you know I was perfect or anything but again it gets into some of the socially acceptable sins and those in kinds of things but really they were in a position where they went from like their reputation is already tarnished their reputation is already what it is they're naturally coming from a place of surrender because it's kind of like rock bottom. And God steps into the rock bottom in that place of surrender and lifts them out and their lives are radically changed. And obviously everybody thought that they were drug dealers and, and all, or, you know, all these things already. So it's like anything, you know, a crazy Jesus freak is a big improvement <laughs> uh, in those cases where for a lot of us it's, it feels something different and scary and, and all these things. So it was this like, man, like, what's it going to take? And so honestly, the biggest game changer was just reading the Bible every morning. And I committed about five years ago, I committed to reading the Bible every morning. And I wake up around, you know, 5, 5.15 uh, before the kids get out of bed and, and try to spend an hour, hour and a half just reading the word and praying. And Dan Muller said, you know, this great phrase of don't read the Bible to get through it, read it to become it. So one of the biggest changes for me was when I started reading the Bible to become it. It wasn't about, that's why I'm not a big fan of like the, you know, one-year plan for reading the Bible. Because it's set a pace, and now i got to keep up, and oh man, I just fell like three days down, and i got to catch up, and I'm going to skim through these, and oh, that's Leviticus, Leviticus anyway. Uh, who really needs that? And, then, <laughs> and it's just like, oh, these are minor prophets, uh, come on. And so it creates this pace rather than transformation. And so when you slow down to read the word, not to get through it, to become it, it takes on a different heart posture. And what if I actually believed this stuff? What if I actually believed? And that's why, like, if you actually, you know, a lot of Christians will say, I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. But then not read it. It's like, you can't logically say that. You, if you say that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then you, you would have to read that. And I had a student one time, her non-Christian friend asked her, the reason I'm getting into this is because your question is not an easy one that can be answered in, in a short thing, but this student of mine, she was a Christian, her non-Christian friend asked her, like, have you, read the, have you read the whole Bible? And she's like, you know, I had to be honest and tell her that I hadn't, that I'd read portions of it and obviously heard a lot of sermons, but I hadn't read the whole thing. And she said, well, you know, it's just kind of interesting to me because I've asked that same question to several Christian friends of mine and none of them have read the Bible. She said, I just kind of assumed that if you were dedicating your whole life to it, that you would have at least read it once. And it just pierced her heart the next day. She was, you better believe she was waking up reading the Bible. And it's like, you can't, so it's also these things, like, 
you can't say that you believe God can heal people, but then never pray for somebody to be healed. Otherwise, that's just kind of cruel. Like, oh, for sure, I believe you know, God can heal Mark. But peace, Mark, have a good night. Uh, so you have to actually, somebody's got to be willing to call us out on our stuff and be like, you can't say this and then do that. You can't say that you believe that, that Christ is Savior and Lord over your life and then not obey his commands. Lord and disobedience just don't go together. So it, it's, it was actually like forcing myself to like get into these ideas and unpack. I say that I believe this, but I do that. And, and that just, then I obviously don't believe this. And if I don't believe that, okay, let me at least stop and deal with that. And that's where Dallas Willard says, you know, if you want to know what a person believes, then just look to what they do. Not to what they say, but what they do. And so these are all processes that were, and then it was just small, small wins, small wins, small wins, and not getting caught up in condemnation, even when I failed and when I wimped out, when I chickened out. And I still wimp out and chicken out probably every week. But not getting caught up in shame and condemnation from that. But just, okay, wake up every morning. God, I thank you for, for who you are and, and who you are in my life. I thank you that I'm a new creation in Christ. I thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. And I thank you that today is a, a day to rise and shine and to live for you. And so that's where, you know, even in, with Dan Moeller, this guy that I watch, he says, you know, uh, there are no bad days in Christianity, just opportunities to shine. And so it, it's also just really taking this thing seriously in terms of getting into the word, understanding what you believe about yourself, what lies you've allowed to come in, and what God wants to, to speak truths into that and shine a light on, on those dark spots in our minds and actually be transformed from the inside out. And that's why, um, you know, I, I try to teach my students and it, and it stinks because they, they push back because all they want is behavior modification. And I want to give them heart transformation and the idea of sanctification. Sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Christ. And so it become, we become more and more like Christ from one degree of glory to another. But sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ, without heart transformation, is merely behavior modification. And behavior modification without heart transformation always leads to burnout. So when we just try to get people to change their behavior, it's going to lead, lead to burnout because they don't have heart transformation. If we just try to get people to step out and do this stuff purely through behavior modification, it's going to lead to burnout. It's going to lead to shame and condemnation. But rather than approach it from transfer, heart transformation where you have a heart for people, and I pray, God, continue to give me a tender heart. My wife says, I have a heart of stone because I don't cry. Uh, she gets, you know, when the spirit moves, like she cries, and I do too, even with that song that we were singing earlier and, and stuff like that, but I've had to, you know, pray and ask God to give me a tender heart for people. Give me a greater love for people. Give me a, a greater level of compassion for people. And, and allow me to see people the way that you see them. Get my eyes off the flesh. And it says people see the outer appearance, but God sees people's heart. Man, if you can just, God, if you can just let me see their heart. And, and it's this process of just radically going into the word of God, trying to be transformed from the inside out. And, and I want this so bad, and I'm never going to stop until I, until I get there. God, I'm going to pursue you no matter how slow this journey is, how slow this process is, how slow my transformation is. I'm going after you 100% until the day that I die, and, and I'm not going to worry about all this other stuff. And, and so, obviously, we've got to be in the world but not of the world, and that's a big part of it, of walking a different pace and being willing to sacrifice all these other possibilities and all these other things. And, and so it's just this radical transformation of becoming more and more like Christ, being filled up with love, being moved by compassion, reviewing the game film. Don't get hung up on shame and condemnation. Just review the game film and, and learn something from those misses and from those losses. Okay, I'm better equipped for tomorrow. Man, I fell for it again, but I'm not going to get hung up in con shame and condemnation. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing because of this conviction that moves me to grow me and, and push me out. And give me another chance, Lord. Give me another chance. And so that's that, that process. Yeah. All right, real quick. Um, he's going to drive back to the visitor tonight. It'd be nice if he didn't have to take any books with him. <laughs> so after I pray, if somebody wants to go man the book table, some of you might have a question that you weren't 
uh, yeah. didn't have the nerve to come up and say in front of everybody, so he can be here for a little bit for that. Um, two, two minutes of takeaway, real quick. My takeaway from all this, I want to share with you an encouragement. One is Kathleen was talking about fear. Ryan talks about in Divine Opportunity that fear is often a signal of spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is often Satan's attack because, as Ryan was saying, uh, a moment of promise or potential is just ahead. And so if we can see we're right on the cusp of promise and potential, oftentimes we will push through. And two quick takeaways from this morning and this evening is notice how few of the stories that Ryan talked about were leading somebody in a salvation prayer. They were, they were exactly what he said, giving someone an experience of God. And my last challenge is this. Your life will change when you go from saying, hey, I'll pray for you, to saying, can I pray for you right now? Because part of them experiencing God is mm -hmm. that prayer that happens right there. All the stories, it's about that. So something simple for me that breaks it down, makes it easy for maybe all of us. I want to pray for Ryan, give you guys opportunity, a few more questions, buy books. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Father God, thank you so much for Ryan and his family. Thank you for how you've used him in amazing ways just to spread your gospel and message and to encourage others through hope and motivation and inspirational stories about how your Holy Spirit works and heals and does miraculous things. If we will just be willing to give ourselves and not withhold mm -hmm. ourselves. Thank you for how Ryan has given himself to us both this morning and this evening. Please bless him and his family abundantly because of this and continue to protect them and provide for them. We thank you for them so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray a quick activation for you all real quick as, as well. And the reason I shared those different combos of spiral of silence, political correctness, busy technology, is that so many people want to reach out, and it's not just because we're wimpy Christians. It's because we're up against a lot of spiritual warfare, and we have to realize the battle we're up against. So the reason you, you don't step out or don't do this or don't do that, it's not just because you're a wimpy Christian. It's because we're up against a battle, and we've got to be realistic about what that is. And it's just about equipping and, and encouraging and sending people out. So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for every single person in this room that has a heart to step out and a desire for their own divine opportunities and their own desire for their own divine appointments, that they want the boldness to be able to step out and to pray for people, that right now, God, that you just do a mighty work in their hearts and in their minds, that today is a new day with fresh beginnings, that tomorrow when they wake up, your mercies are new every single morning, that it's a fresh start to the week, it's a new week ahead, and Lord, I just pray for uh, a divine appointment for each person throughout the course of this week, whether it's a simple prayer for a waiter or waitress or a coworker, or, or somebody at a grocery store or Target or wherever it is, but they just create opportunities. And they look for more and more opportunities. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 All right, God bless you all.